Welcome everyone to AACC's $100,000 business pitch competition. Thank you so much for muting your mics and stopping your videos so that we can um, focus on our finalists today. I'm Stephanie Goldenberg. I'm Interim Academic Chair for Entrepreneurial Studies Institute. And with me today is my co mc Stacey Korbelak, Assistant Dean for Business, Economics, and Entrepreneurial Studies, or otherwise known as BEES. Good afternoon, everybody. Today will be an exciting event, one that we have been planning for months. But before we get started, Dr. Lindsay, the president of AACC, would like to share her words of welcome. Hey, I'd like to welcome everyone to Anne Arundel Community College's $100,000 business pitch competition. This event is very special this year. It's the first time it's ever been held virtually due to the COVID-19 challenges. And I'm really, really glad we found a way to bring this together. So um, thank you, Stephanie, and everybody that you've been working with to make this happen. We do know that our students look forward to this event all year long. And it is a wonderful opportunity to get feedback and financial assistance to help them launch and grow their businesses. And we could all use something positive right now. So this is an exciting, exciting afternoon. For more than 50 years, Anne Arundel Community College has proudly served the diverse needs of Anne Arundel County by bringing educational excellence and innovation to our community and our region. This event is just one of many that engages students in real world experiences to prepare them for their futures. Students can redefine themselves at AACC by starting their own business, by taking courses in entrepreneurship, and clearly with the support of our faculty, mentors, and partners, such as the Radcliffe Foundation, SCORE, and SBDC. I'd really like to thank our sponsors, the Philip E. and Carol R. Radcliffe Foundation for the support of this event, and very um, welcoming to a new role, Carlene Cassidy and Chief Staff Support here representing the foundation. I want to congratulate our nine student finalists who are competing to get today. And now I'm going to turn the program over to Karen Cook, Dean of the School of Business and Law. Good luck, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Dr. Lindsay said, uh, my name is Karen Cook, and I'm the Dean of the School of Business and Law. Um, I want to also welcome you to our uh, annual $100,000 business pitch competition. As you know, Anne Arundel County and the surrounding region is home to many small businesses, including many of you who are here with us today on Zoom. We value you and all small business owners and aspiring entrepreneurs, especially at this very challenging time that we're all experiencing. At AACC, our Entrepreneurial Studies Institute offers resources, networking, and most importantly, the education to help aspiring entrepreneurs and small business owners launch or grow their businesses. Last year, we awarded $50,000 in seed funds and more than $72,000 in scholarships. We are looking forward to hearing this year's finalists explain their exciting business ideas and pitch their plans. Before we get started, I, I did want to take a moment to give a huge thank you to Assistant Dean Stacy Korbleck, ESI Chair Stephanie Goldenberg, Steve Berry, Tony Baker, and uh, Emily, everyone in ESI and the School of Business and Law who made this virtual business pitch competition a reality. It certainly was no small feat. I also wanna thank our judges uh, for your participation today and for volu volunteering your time and talents. And I just wanted to go through and list um, uh, and specifically announce all of our judges. Vaughn Buck, SCORE mentor, Tina Davenport from the Philip E. and Carol R. Radcliffe Foundation. Joyce Ezro, retired AAC professor in business management and entrepreneurial studies. Tim Hanlon, SCORE mentor. Dr. Alicia Marshall, associate vice president for learning and academic affairs at AACC. I apologize for that. Um, Candace Pruitt, business consultant, small business development center and an adjunct faculty member in entrepreneurial studies. Lastly, but certainly not least, I want to thank most sincerely our sponsor, the Philip E. and Carol R. Radcliffe Foundation. This event would not be possible without all of your support. We're very happy to have here today, Carlene Cassidy, the new director of the Radcliffe Foundation, as well as Tina Davenport, Radcliffe trustee and judge. Thank you both for being here. And thank you for all that you do for AACC and our student entrepreneurs. 
Now I will turn it over to Stephanie Goldenberg and Stacy Korblak, who will explain the competition and announce our finalists. Good luck to all of you competitors. Go Riverhawks. Thank you so much, Dr. Lindsay and Dean Cook. We really appreciate it. So just um, one more reminder, if you are not speaking, could you please mute your, um, your mic? And also you can stop video, which would um, remove you from the whole um, speaker view. So if you do that, you can still be a part of the, um, the competition, but it does help you. So um, what I wanted to do is also explain that if you wanted to change your view in Zoom, and again, in the upper right-hand corner, you can, um, select your view. And um, we have closed caption ability. And that's thanks to AACC's DSS office for arranging this for us. And John Wood, thank you both. Thank you all so much so that we have this ability. Um, I've also posted the business pitch program in the chat box. It was done very early in the chat. So you would have to scroll all the way up to the top. Um, but if you do that, you are able to have a memento from today's competition. And thank you, thank you to uh, Professor Terry for being our timer today. She is our official timer for the competition, making sure that you stick to your two-minute pitch and your five minutes for Q&A. Thank you, Terry. And then Stacy's going to share what's next. We are almost ready for the competition. This portion is going to take about 90 minutes. Each finalist is going to get two minutes to pitch, and then the judges have a five-minute Q&A. There's about a three minute transition between finalists and the presentation order today is alphabetical to create a smooth transition between each finalist. Today's first finalist to pitch is Nakia Cheeks with her business Baked and Brunched. Nakia, please prepare to pitch and let us know when you're ready. I'm ready. Good afternoon. After tragically and suddenly losing my fiance, I turned to baking. In my new normal, it became my therapy, something that I look forward to, something that got me through such a tough time in my life, and something that allowed my creativity to flourish. It became my passion, and Baked and Brunch was born. Baked and Brunch elicits joy, gives me hope, and motivates me to keep pushing. As a new resident of Prince George's County, the lack of access to fresh, healthy baked goods was immediately evident. There are countless bakeries within the county. However, I only found three retail bakeries and three grocers that sell these items, of which only one offers organic and three offer vegan options. County consumers want these healthy options but are forced outside of the county to obtain them. In a county over 900,000 residents, this lack of access is something that we can fill. Baked and Brunch aims to provide another option for fresh, healthy baked goods to Prince George's County consumers. Through word of mouth, social media, and pop-up shops, we will target and reach these consumers. We have hand-picked suppliers that offer all natural and or certified organic products. Therefore, we can confidently stand behind our products and ensure their quality. We support the local economy by buying fresh organic seasonal produce and dairy products from local suppliers. We are then able to offer competitively priced healthy products to price sensitive consumers. Once upon a time, I interned for Damon John of Shark Tank for one year. This experience was my first taste of small business ownership and it sharpened my focus of becoming an entrepreneur. I'm just an accountant with a passion for baking, fair access to healthy food options and spreading joy. Winning $25,000 would allow me to make immense strides towards making my passion and dream a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Nakia. Now the judges and Nakia have about five minutes for Q&A and I will call on each judge in alphabetical order. Uh, Alicia, do you have any questions for Nakia? Uh, yes, uh, Nakia, I want to commend you for, um, you know, kind of turning an adverse, um, ad something that's, you know, devastating a loss into uh, a strength mm -hmm. and, a, and a business. And I can relate to that. So I really want to commend oh, you for a while. That. Yes. Um, right. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to turn my video on also. Um, Congratulations. 
Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, what did you plan to do with the $25,000 for if you were to, to win that? Unfortunately, with COVID-19, the atmosphere has completely shifted. I'm presently our cottage food business. However, I know for myself, I don't know how comfortable I would be to continue um, purchasing from cottage food businesses with the state of the current health crisis. So part of the money would be used towards securing space in a commercial food kitchen that's been inspected and certified by the health department. Another part that also is in line with COVID would be to revamp my website and to add a e-commerce function that would allow me to take online orders either through social media or directly through my e-commerce website. And another portion would be towards, hopefully COVID will be behind us before the end of the year because part of my distribution channel is attending pop-up shops and vending um, in person. And of course, I'm not able to do that, but once COVID has passed us, part of the money would be used to purchase ingredients so that I can participate in these pop-up shops. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Candace, do you have any questions? Hello. Uh, you, you did a fantastic job on your pitch, and I can tell you've really practiced. And it was interesting to hear that you did your internship with Damien from Shark Tank. I did have a question regarding your business revenues in 2019. I know you've been in the ramp up uh, process, but what were your sales for 2019? Uh, first portion of 2019 was really spent just working on my recipes and finding suppliers. In September through December, I participated in a total of four pop-up shops and I averaged between $300 to $350 in profit per pop-up shop. And I was registered to participate in four this spring that have either been canceled and or postponed until we're able to get out again. Thank you. You're welcome. Joyce, do you have any questions? How about Tim? Hi, how are you? Um, I want to compliment you on your name. I really uh, was drawn to that. And uh, I uh, have to give you a lot of credit for working in a pretty adverse um, environment the world, COVID and what it's doing. Um, I understand that flour is a very rare commodity right now, so I, um, I'm sure your suppliers will take care of you on that. Um, my, my question is probably more practical in terms of how you um, are going to anticipate developing your customers. In other words, how, how are you going to actually um, get customers to start using your product and what your plans might be on in terms of that? Yeah, thank you, first of all. Um, I definitely plan to use this time that we're all stuck in the house to fully utilize social media. And prior to the pop-up shops that I participated in, I did campaigns on Facebook and also on Instagram to get people to visit my website and or the details of the event or my social media pages. So my plan really for the next, and I guess indefinitely, and while we're still in this pandemic is to really fully utilize social media and use that to interact with and hopefully secure no some customers so that when I am able to participate in vending events, they'll be apprised of those events hopefully will attend where I can interact with them in person, answer any questions that they may have regarding the ingredients. And um, pretty much that's my plan is social media. Well, well great. I wish you the best and um, oh. good luck. Thank you. All right, time is up for the five minutes for the judges.
Thank you, Terry, and thank you, Nakia, and thank, thank you. you. All right, so if you are, um, if your mic is live, can we please mute your mic? And so, Nakia, thank you so very much. You can um, mute your mic for now. All right. So during the time that we transition between finalists, um, we're going to share some information about the competition, hopefully to motivate you in, an, in the audience to compete next year um, or to try again. Um, we know that multiple times sometimes is the payoff. So um, we also want to share some, you know, upcoming opportunities. And we're going to first discuss how the finalists were selected. Yes, part of this is just buying a little time so our judges can take some notes and um, be ready for the next finalist. So bear with me. Each finalist submitted a comprehensive business plan of no more than 10 pages. The first round judges scored these online. After the scores were averaged, the top nine businesses were selected to pitch today. And the business owners that are, um, who are pitching today, two of the nine are Radcliffe Scholars. <clears throat> One was an officer in the Entrepreneurs Club, and many were a part of the Entrepreneurs Club. So they are competing for $50,000 in seed funds. I mean, that's amazing. Um, and some are also competing for membership in our business incubator. And we are also awarding a fan favorite award of $500 that you, our Zoom audience, can choose. We'll share the poll after everyone has um, pitched, and then we will announce our fan favorite winner before the main awards are announced. Okay. Judges, are you ready? And judges, you can show your, your screen if you, if you would like. Um, and just give me a thumbs up, maybe Joyce. Are we ready? Okay. The next business owner to pitch is Zachary Waller with his business, Bookkeepers by the Bay. Zachary, please prepare to pitch and signal that you are ready. I'm ready. During this government-induced business shutdown and the impact the COVID-19 virus will have on the business environment, Bookkeepers by the Bay is positioned to capitalize on the growing secular trend of working from anywhere. My name is Zachary Waller. While working towards my certified public accountant license, I noticed the importance of bookkeeping for businesses and an ability to build a strong business relationship with, with clients through a virtual atmosphere. In 2019, I earned my, cert my CPA license and started Bookkeepers by the Bay, which provides virtual analysis and bookkeeping services to the health and wellness, real estate, sports and recreation, and nonprofit industries within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. The virtual services provides my clients the flexibility to meet with myself or my team from anywhere they have access to the internet. To attract clients, I, I attend weekly networking events, post information on my social media, and word of mouth referrals. A goal of Bookkeepers by the Bay is to make bookkeeping services or procedures more efficient. This year, I met a milestone of this goal by reducing the time it takes to import accounts payable transactions to an accounting software by utilizing the T-Rex Designer platform. I am requesting seed funds of $25,000 to provide my firm with necessary equipment upgrades and annual license to my preferred e-infrastructure. This will enhance my, my ability to capitalize on the growing secular trend of working from anywhere, ensure client financial security, and build automated workflows for more efficient monthly reporting of business activity to management. Please join me on my journey to be the leading strategic partner for socially responsible organizations within the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Thank you for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. All right, judges, so now it is time for you to um, be able to ask some questions. And so I'm going to um, call on um, Tina because you weren't chosen last time to ask a question. Do you have any questions, Tina? Um, I just thought his presentation was great and his uh, business plan I thought was outstanding. And I'm just curious, I know he got a CPA last year, but what types of revenue did he have during 2019 um, based upon just getting his CPA? That's a, that's a great question. Um, 
Last year, I actually started with a firm called Alta CPA in Annapolis and started bookkeepers by the bay prior to joining them. And with my firm specifically, I made about $3,000 in revenue. Um, and that was on top of my salary, uh, which with that firm, we're working on an agreement to uh, have me become a contra um, contractor and build my business uh, with this uh, competition would definitely help me. And I have a question from Joyce, um, and she would like to know uh, uh, what segment of your target market are you having the most success with? So I'm, I'm actually having the most success with the nonprofit sector. Uh, that sector is a good niche to uh, specialize in because it is very different than normal business structures. And I do like the C3, C4 difference. So understanding the difference between the IRS's um, 990 structure uh, is important and a, a good um, you know, niche market to uh, go after. And Vaughn, do you have a question? Yeah, how many clients do you have at the moment? So I have three clients underneath of a full-time uh, bookkeeping clients. Uh, and then I get a few here and there. Um, you know, with especially this current situation, I've gotten about two or three clients to help out with the PPP loans or the EIDL uh, application. Um, but outside of the firm itself, you know, hopefully we can bring on nonprofit clients from Alta, uh, and that would be two additional clients from them. What's your billing uh, cost per hour? So I actually do not do a billing per hour. I like to do a uh, cost that, or not a cost, but a value pricing uh, structure so that uh, no matter how much time it takes me to do a procedure, uh, it's all based on the client's um, you know, value uh, present presentation. So especially with my uh, T-Rex designer, um, knowledge, I can actually reduce my speed and time it takes to do a procedure, which takes three hours and I can reduce it to uh, less than 30 minutes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Joyce, did you have another question? Okay, I can't hear. So I'm gonna ask you to type your question, Joyce. And then um, we'll ask Candace, do you have a question for now? Hi, Zach, I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I would like you to elaborate on how the $25,000 uh, would be used for the startup cost for your business, just because I'm thinking virtually a lower overhead. Could you elaborate a little bit more? And then I have a follow-up question is how have you used the funds from another business plan pitch competition you were in with the SBDC to grow your business? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the first question I believe was, um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm sorry, um, but let me, let me go back. Uh, could you actually repeat that question? I'm so sorry. Sure. Um, how are you going to be using the $25,000 to grow your business? Okay. So the $25,000 will be partially for equipment upgrades. Uh, currently I'm using equipment from my employer, um, and I would like to set up my own home office uh, with equipment. And then the other portion would go towards my core capital requirement, which is three months of, of my um, overhead, which is the e-infrastructure. So that would include the Alterix designer, um, AlterTax, which is tax preparation software, and other like Microsoft Office uh, applications to uh, provide my clients with financial security and speed of uh, deliverer for reports. Thank you. And then how have you used the funds from the previous competitions to help grow your business? So with my uh, business competition with, I think it was a Bowie, um, uh, I believe, and I used that funds. I received $250 and I hired a contractor. So I was training, I've been training that contractor to do some bookkeeping for my uh, clients that are on a recurring basis. We have 30 seconds. Dr. Marshall, did you have a question? Um, a quick question. Um, how do you see yourself? What makes your business stand apart from, from others? How, what would you describe as setting you apart? Okay. 
that's a good question because it's, you know, how do I differentiate from all the bookkeepers or all of the accountants that are out there? Um, because anybody can really do bookkeeping. Um, and I differentiate with being a CPA, uh, providing that level of knowledge to my clients so that if they need additional services, I, I can come in there and do those services. And also with a traditional firm, you would have a brick and mortar office. You would have the client come to the office, invest their time with a virtual firm. Sorry, I got to cut you off. It's five minutes. I'm so sorry. I don't like to be the bad guy, but Terry texted me and said it was five minutes was up. So okay. Okay. congratulations no. on your pitch. Thank you very much, judges. Thank you, Zachary. Stacy, you're next. I have to unmute myself. Next, I want to review today's process for everyone. There is not a first, second, or third place. Instead, the judges deliberate and then potentially award seed funds based on the business pitch and the written business plan. It usually takes about 30 minutes for our judges to deliberate. And during the break, we will host a facilitated networking session. Professor Steve Berry and Daniel Levy, the president of the Entrepreneurs Club, Entrepreneurs Club will be your hosts during that time. Stephanie and I will be with the judges to facilitate the awards deliberation in a separate Zoom breakout room. At approximately 4.30 p.m. or 30 minutes after the last pitch, we will return to present the awards. In addition, we'll, we will also be announcing the new cohort of Radcliffe Scholars. This spring, we are announcing 15 new scholars. Judges, are you ready? Yes. Okay. The next business owner to pitch is Heidi Penna with her business, Casa Penna Designs. Heidi, please prepare to pitch and let us know when you're ready. I'm ready. Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My passion for design started young. I have fond memories from childhood, um, updating my parents' home, often enlisting the help of my little brother to help move furniture. My parents would come home totally surprised to see a completely different living room layout. I'm Heidi Penna, design principal behind Casa Penna Designs. After a career in business management and some serious reflection, I decided to pursue my dream. I now get to focus on creating beautiful spaces and memorable events that incorporate wellness and sustainability. According to the EPA, the average American spends more than 90% of their time indoors, where air pollutants are two to five times greater than that of outdoors. Over the last 24 months in business, I found I truly enjoy working to support my wellness-minded clients to discover their needs and accomplish their goals of creating a healthy living environment. My business has grown each year, largely through word of mouth. I've taken on new clients and maintained repeat clients. To be honest, my client testimonials have inspired me to take my business to the next level. My interiors client, Christina, said, you're amazing at what you do. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. This comment means the world to me because I put a lot of consideration and thoughtfulness into each room that I design. A past events client said, the support Heidi provides before, during, and after an event is wonderful. I love that my client feels supported every step of the way. That's what I'm here for, to think through every detail for them. Nothing makes me happier to see it than when I see how delighted my clients are in their newly redesigned home. Be a part of my success. Word of mouth has proven so successful for Casa Penna Designs that I am now building the first marketing campaign. Ask me how photography, updates to my website, and passing a well certification will connect me with my niche audience and grow my business. Thank you, Heidi. Now the judges and Heidi have about five minutes for the Q&A session, and I'm going to start if Tim has a question. How about... I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't uh, take all this time. Uh, I have to have to get the voice back on. Um, I really like your presentation, uh, Heidi. Um, Thank you. And I think it's important. I agree with you. It's important to have a, a, a good place to return. Too. Um, I'm curious about how you 
your thoughts are about uh, networking your business in the environment we're in, uh, since we're not working face to face with so many people these days. Uh, yeah, so in the design world, uh, social media is a huge presence for us um, with a lot of seasoned designers stating that they get the majority of their business from social media posting. Um, so I'm excited to get started on a marketing campaign and, and really get myself out there in front of my niche audience in that way. Great. Wish you luck. Good. Thank you. I have a question from Joyce, Stacey. Okay. Um, she would like to know, um, please give us an example of creating a healthy living environment, Heidi. Sure, uh, so a healthy living environment includes anything from uh, air quality, which can be controlled through uh, something as simple as having house plants. Uh, one fun fact is a snake plant, which is a very common uh, plant. Um, it controls, it helps you uh, control the, the, um, the room uh, humidity level and as well um, process the air quality for you. Um, other factors include uh, sound control, uh, not being able to hear your noisy neighbor next door. Um, it, can, it can also include um, just making sure you are uh, choosing furnishings that are not off-gassing, uh, maybe that didn't have, uh, aren't traveling from across the world. Uh, they have a, a lower um, standpoint from that perspective. Um, lots of different ways. Thanks. Alicia, do you have any questions? Yeah, I have a similar question to the last one. What, um, what do you think sets, your, sets you apart? Why would someone choose you to design their home? Definitely the wellness aspect. Um, if you go to the well certification website uh, and you can, you can put in a search where uh, you can try to find somebody who's well certified, uh, there's almost no residential designers that are well certified as of yet. Um, it's a relatively new certification. I think it's been around for about three years. Uh, and the majority of the people that are certified are architects and commercial designers. Thank you. Tina, anything for Heidi? Yes. Um, I was wondering if she could give us a little more detail about her expenses. It seems from her financial plan that she has underestimated some of her expenses. And I was just curious how she came up with them. Um, is there something specific that you were looking to at or? Well, I was looking at like some of your website expenses, um, insurance, legal and accounting, quite a few of them. I was just curious how you came up with them. Uh, so those, so the historical are their actual expenses. Um, I run this business from my home, so there's not a whole lot of office expense or, um, and the insurance is that's the the cost of of running uh, an interior design firm. Um, there's not a whole lot of liability involved, um, so the the fees, the my annual uh, fees for that are are pretty low. Okay, how about Candice? Hi, I was very impressed with your website and I actually recognize some of the um, photos from your clients that have been broadcasted in newspapers. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on your clientele? Uh, so a lot of my clientele comes to me through um, the, the, my events clientele um, drives my um, interior design clientele. So a lot of times um, I'm working with uh, national nonprofits and at these events to get to know their clients a little bit. Um, and through that, they get to know that I also do, I also offer um, interior design services and a lot of them are already wellness minded individuals. And so from there, uh, they kind of check out my website and get excited and then reach out to me uh, for some design as well. Vaughn, anything for Heidi? No. All right. Well, thank you, Heidi, and thank you to our judges. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so, Steve, you could, we have four people in the waiting room, so they're at the door. We could allow them in now. Hopefully, they have muted their mics, so um, you can go ahead and let them in. Okay. 
So now I'm going to share a little bit about the judging criteria. Uh, the first round judges used a 100 point scoring rubric to determine today's finalists. And you might wonder what were they looking for? Um, they're looking for the feasibility of the business idea, including appropriate concept testing, value proposition, competitive advantage, plans for generating profit or income, clearly defined target market, appropriate marketing and sales approaches, experienced team members to implement this plan, and a reasonable financial plan. Today's judges are considering the same criteria, and then they're also looking at your, the effectiveness of your pitch, as well as um, the uh, Q&A session. Okay, so hopefully I have uh, covered a little bit of time to allow our judges to take some notes. And um, our next business owner to pitch is Jessica Flaherty of Clover Run Writing. Jessica, please prepare to pitch and signal when you are ready. I'm going to also say um, Jessica is um, not in her um, her setup for her pitch, um, that she did share what her space would look like, um, but she is taking care of a sick horse. So I'm going to hand it over to Jessica. When you are ready, please let me know. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, then I'm ready. All right, as we are all aware, the coronavirus shutdown has brought our lives to a screeching halt and everyone is going stir crazy. Have you started to think about what you might like to do once the restrictions are lifted? What if I could offer you an outdoor activity that is physically, emotionally, and mentally engaging, completely tailored to you, and involves an animal that is guaranteed to be your friend? At Clover Run Riding, this is exactly what I do. Horses are amazing creatures. They have unique personalities and they form deep and lasting bonds with their riders and their handlers, very similar to your dog or cat. Um, in addition to these bonds, horseback riding offers a recreational outlet, self-care therapies, and competitive opportunities for the riders that wish to pursue them. In my program, I work with all of my riders. I learn their unique personalities, their individual learning styles, and I match them with a horse that will help them meet their goals. In my first year of operation, I experienced an 83% client retention rate, and the clients I did not retain were not lost to the competition. So that statistic matched with my testimonials shows that my program works. As people start to come out of this government shutdown, they're going to be looking for engaging activities where they can continue to practice safe social distancing. And Clover Run is uniquely uh, poised right now to capitalize on this movement. I'm asking for a $20,000 investment to aggressively market my program and to help me obtain some beneficial certification that's going to guarantee I stay at the top of my field, along with investing in the property just to make sure that we continue to provide a spectacular product. So thank you and enjoy the ride. Thanks so much. And thank you for being resilient. I, I know that um, you're not in the situation that you would like to be in. And I posted just for everybody to know um, in the group chat, I also posted what her backdrop would have looked like had she been able to do that in person. So now I'm going to ask our, um, our judges for their questions. And we will start this time with Alicia. Hi, uh, that was a great presentation. Um, I, I do see that that would be something that people might um, kind of flock to after the COVID is over, but I'm wondering about your marketing plan. Have you thought about the fact that um, horseback riding is mm -hmm. one of those things that people are into um, and then they do it and so kind of getting people that maybe don't think about horseback riding as a viable activity to have it become part of something that they do um, can you talk a little bit about your marketing plan in that way? That's exactly what I'm asking for this money for, is to market to those people who might not have previously thought about riding. Um, most of our target market is teenagers. They use social media incredibly. So throwing some ads out there with some key tag words that maybe if they're looking for um, things to do with friends, researching some tag words we can use for that. Also going to some of the farmer's markets, doing pony rides, and just really pushing this out 
uh, we're very close to Annapolis and other metropolitan areas. So this is literally in your backyard and it just bring it to the forefront of people's minds. Thank you. Okay, um, Tina, you have a question? Yes, um, I thought your business plan was great. Um, and I have some questions about your money, how you were proposed to spend the money. You um, put down um, some infrastructure on your farm and yeah. entry signs, solar power lights. I mean, I'm just curious, how is that really going to impact your marketing and the use of your money for those types of things? So the lights wouldn't impact the marketing so much. That is more of a, as we are continue with this um, social distancing, instead of having 10, 12 people at the farm at the same time, I'm gonna have to uh, really space people out and run lessons later into the evening. Um, so we're gonna need to light up the arena. I currently have lights, but by replacing the electrical lights with the solar power, it's going to keep my electricity bill down um, so that I'm not losing the income from the additional lessons into my electricity bill. And there's a question from Joyce. Um, what are you doing now to obtain uh, boarding customers? Hopefully I asked that correctly, Joyce. Um, so I, I have some boarders right now um, and it's, it's difficult with the shutdown uh, because we can't bring people in to tour the facility, um, but just pushing out on Facebook uh, and pushing out on some of the different um, horse forums, what my facility is and trying to get people engaged. So as soon as restrictions are lifted, I ha have had some people that are asking questions that want to come out and see the property as soon as they can. Wonderful. And um, Candace, do you have a question? Hi, Jessica. Thank you so much for including your 2019 P&L and explaining those investments. Um, I did have a question about your legal structure. So right now you're operating as a sole proprietor. Have you considered changing that to an LLC to separate you, your liability from your business? I absolutely have. That was part of my ask. Um, the thing I intended to do this year um, with some personal capital that is now just being invested into just keeping my horses fed. So it is part of my um, investment ask today is to cover the legal fees to do that. Thank you. And, and Vaughn, do you have a question? No, no. Tim? Tim, do you have a question? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Anybody else have a question? We're almost probably at the time, the five minute time. Okay. Well, thank you so very much. And thank you all for your great question. Stacy, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. I would like to take a minute now to share some information about the Entrepreneurial Studies Institute. ESI offers a certificate and an applied associate's degree in entrepreneurship with courses that are designed to teach you how to start and grow a new business venture. We also have the Hatchery, which you might have seen earlier, a small business resource center with a mini maker space that includes a 3D printer, magnet and button making equipment, a sewing machine, a computer equipment, and it's all there to assist you in planning your business and creating rapid product prototypes. We can't wait to return to campus so we can put all of our good resources to use. Students can use the Hatchery for their business they can use it to meet other students or to conduct con concept testing. Some of our favorite times are when our culinary students are seeking feedback on class projects. The next business for today to pitch is Jenna Bruxfort and her business, Love Wola. Jenna, please prepare to pitch and signal when you're ready. I'm ready. Hi, I'm Jenna, and this is the head of my product development team, Lola. Together, we founded Lab Lola, an e-commerce speed to see company that creates true to nature pinecone toys for dogs. We're seeking $15,000 for our production molding costs. Judges, if you've ever peered down the dog toy aisle at your local pet store, you probably saw something like this. Every color in the book and all kinds of shapes that you couldn't find in any book. See, this has been the industry go-to for some time now. 
You take a bright color, you slap it on a piece of rubber that looks like it's been melting in the sun all day, and voila, you've got yourself a brand new wackadoo dog toy. But see, it hasn't always been this way. Millions of years ago, before dogs were sleeping on memory foam and eating artisanal pork bits, they were living in dens, hunting in packs, and scampering across the forest floor. They didn't have wackadoos or roughy plushies or anything like that. They had pine cones. The pine cone was the very first dog toy, played with and chewed on for so long that it evolved into an instinctual behavior of play for dogs. So at Lab Lola, we're creating pine cone toys that naturally intrigue their wild, fluffy selves, while also appealing to their adventurous, hopefully not so fluffy humans. The Lab Lola pine cone is based off of the Lab Lolly pine cone. It'll be its natural brown color and pine, and pine scented. The bottom is textured for smearing peanut butter and the inside is hollow for stuffing kibble. The scales extend out, creating little nooks for tucking treats. We're targeting a niche market of humans who love nature almost as much as they love their dogs and want toys for their dogs that align with their outdoorsy lifestyle. Judges, what started out as this dog's pastime one fall day up at the lake is now a patented design awaiting production. Come join us on our adventure. Your dog will thank you later. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Now the judges and Jenna have five minutes for Q&A. And I'll start with Vaughn. Do you have any questions for Jenna? Yeah, when I was looking at your uh, financials, the cost of goods sold is $5, so 19 margin. But I don't see any other expenses like uh, shipping boxes, uh, labels, packing material, all that, other than the initial order that you uh, are putting in your startup cost. Right, so that $5 that's built into the, the cost of the shipping box and the labels is built into that cost of goods sold. So each pine cone, the large is makes, it's $3 to make and two fifty dollars for the small one. And it's about $1.50 to $2 more for the packaging. So that was part of the cost of goods sold. Thank you. Yep. Candice. Hello, I was wondering where is your manufacturing plant located? They're actually up in Pennsylvania, so we're all completely U.S. based. Okay, and I have one more question. Yeah, sure. Have you been, have you conducted any consumer validation testing, meaning um, asking folks, would you buy this and how much would you be willing to pay? So um, we, our manufacturer is really big in the pet toy industry, and they actually um, brought our product to Petco and BarkBox, and they received it really well. And then they um, sort of informed us on our pricing. Um, Given the complexity of the design and the other things, along with my own research, um, that's sort of where we ended up um, price-wise. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Tina, anything? Yeah, I thought your uh, presentation and plan were great. Um, I, I thought um, you've already done trademarking and um, did all the lawyer the legal things, you did just about everything right. And I just want to commend you for doing that. I think your product's great. Uh, dogs love pine cones. So I think it's fantastic. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. And I have a question from Joyce. Um, what are you doing now while you are dealing with COVID-19 restrictions? So it hasn't really affected us yet because um, our manufacturer is still up and running. And so they're still doing the R&D on the design and um, sort of optimizing the size, the exact proportions, and then the pine scent to get that all right. So it, it hasn't affected us at all yet and it'll be all e-commerce. So it shouldn't affect us at all. Alicia, anything? No questions, thank you. How about Tim? Uh, yes, um, in terms of uh, consumer feedback or, or um, research, have you gotten how, what kind of com comments have you gotten back? And with those comments, how do you plan to actually market the product? Right, so most yes. of our um, market research has been um, on my own without any um, actual like testing because we don't have the hard product in hand yet. This is just our prototype. And then um, the information that we've gotten back from, like I said, Petco and BarkBox, we're pretty interested in it. And then um, our marketing plan is going to be heavily social media based. Um, I have a few partnerships um, with some micro influencers um, across the US and up in Canada, and we're going to um, leverage them in our social media marketing. And then I'm also planning on doing um, some wholesaling to like to third party, um, like online boutiques, not necessarily 
um, the big ones like Petco and PetSmart, but um, like BarkBox would be a good way just to get us out there and get a bunch of exposure um, right off the bat. Well, Petco is a national company, are they not? Yes, they are. Um, will you be able to support them as well as local businesses as, as well? Right. Like, like I said, I'm not, I don't plan on going into Petco, certainly not right away. Um, I think I really want to focus on that initial point of that curve, the early adopters, and not, you know, jump right into the mass market. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna, and thank you to all of our judges. I'll turn it back over to Stephanie. Thanks so much. Would you like to know more about our classes or how you can apply for a $12,000 Entrepreneur Scholarship? Yes, this is a mini commercial during our presentation. Um, you are all invited to our virtual open house. We will post the registration link on our Facebook page and our uh, weekly e-newsletter. Um, it will be held Monday, May 11th, 12 to 1 via our favorite Zoom. Um, the next scholarship application deadline is June 1st, online at noon. And class registration for summer is now open, so you can sign up for classes. And fall semester registration also, also will open June 1st. So don't delay, register today. Okay, the next business owner to pitch is Madison Bird with Powered Puff Protection. Madison, please prepare to pitch and signal when you're ready. Hello, just real quick, would you be able to check the waiting room? It seems my grandmother was kicked out of um, the system. I just want to double check. There's not a chance she can get on before I pitch. That's so cute. There is Thanks, no one Carmen. in the waiting room right okay. now. All right, just wanted to double check. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello everyone, my name is Madison Bird. I'd like you to take a moment and consider what it would be like if all the medication in your medicine cabinet was only found in fragile glass containers with no identifying labels on them. How do you think you would handle your medication if a single bump or fall could cause the container to crack and break, leaving all the medicine you paid good money for ruined on the ground? Would you risk carrying your pain medication with you in your purse or pocket in case of an episode outside of your house? Could you imagine the confusion you would feel when you need your pain medication, but what you picked out could also be sleep medication or even a mood stabilizer? The patients I work with at National Holistic Healing Center, a medical dispensary in DC, deal with these issues with vape cartridges. A tremoring hand or an overstuffed purse could cause an accident that might leave the liquid medication inside these cartridges in a sticky mess. Everyone can agree there's nothing less appealing after you come home from a day of getting groceries, gas, and medication than having to go back to the store, hoping for a replacement so there isn't a lapse in your dosages. After hearing countless patients complain about misidentification or seeing ruined cartridges brought back, I came up with a two birds, one stone solution. My company, Power Puff Protection, will manufacture and sell protective resin sleeves for vape cartridges that will help absorb bumps and falls, reducing possible damage to the glass containers. These sleeves will come in a variety of colors and designs to provide patients with a chance to organize and personalize the various strains they require for the various conditions they use medical marijuana for. Vape cartridges have increased in popularity for many reasons. Patients find them easier to inhale, they last longer, and they take up less space than traditional flower form. Due to these and many other reasons, more patients are trying and sticking with this form of cannabis medication. With this product and subsequent products made by Powered Puff Protection, I can help patients protect and organize their medicine. Thank you for listening, and I hope you join me in my endeavor to help these patients. Thank you so much. Um, now we are going to move on to uh, the Q&A portion. So um, we will start with um, a question. Any questions from Candace? Addison, um, I was just wondering, do you have a manufacturer for your product lined up? I plan on manufacturing these products myself. Um, I plan on oper op operating in a home business um, and in the financial portion I have included prices for uh, the appropriate equipment and materials it would require to create these products. And I would prefer to have the creative um, advantages of making my own and supplying it personally rather than soliciting a manufacturer elsewhere to create it for me. And um, what are the margins going to be? How much is it going to cost for you to make an item? 
So my manufacturing materials will take about $1.23 to create one unit. Um, and I plan on selling one for about $8 to $9.50, depending on the specific style and uh, features on it. Okay, uh, Tina, do you have any questions? Yes, I was wondering about maybe uh, legal issues, current, present, future, um, about, I mean, yesterday or today they just came out about vaping is as bad as cigarettes and what has she set up or considered the liabilities with this business? Interesting question. Uh, I have done a lot of research about the damaging of uh, re reactions from vape cartridges. Um, a, a lot of the research I have found seen that vape cartridges don't have as um, negative effects on the lungs. And um, considering we're an ancillary business, I'm not sure the exact liabilities that would be considered for us, um, considering we're not selling the actual cartridges. That's definitely something I would look into as well. Okay, Vaughn, do you have a question? Yeah, on the business plan, there are three uh, uh, people, uh, uh, but I don't see a lot of wage expense to cover three. Are you just all sharing profits or how's, how's that working? So for the first year, I have um, made an agreement with Miss Julia Ruiz and Hunter Carter. Um, they'll be working as contractors and they'll take a small amount of a fee from this $25,000 that I'm asking for. And then after the company has begun making proper profits and I'm able to supply them with a wage, they'll have a $20 per hour wage um, and it's an estimated 20 hours a, a week. Um, and that'll be found down towards the timeline section of my business plan. And then in year three, I'm projecting that we will increase both uh, hours to about 30 hours a week um, for both of them. And we're gonna stay around the $20 an hour projection for the wages. Tim, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh my question is in terms of how did you come up with um, a need for this product and what you're thinking about that? It, it doesn't so, appear that there's a lot of competitors that are doing something similar to this. So yeah. um, well, can you talk a little bit about your thought planning or process there? Sure. Actually, I was prompted by a final uh, business plan project by my professor um, Ewart, who hopefully is still viewing, um, he asked us to look at the cannabis industry and try to find a problem that needed a solution that I could create a solution for. So uh, considering I already work in a dispensary um, and I am a medical patient as well in DC, um, I just started to pay a little more attention to comments that patients were making to me, um, any particular potential problems that I was having, um, and I kind of zeroed in on the cartridges. So I had a lot of patients come in and say they had issues identifying them when they when they took them out the packaging, because um, you'll see from this example, the actual cartridge has no identifying marks on it, and it tends to have just one tone tips. So once you take it out the packaging, it's very difficult to figure out which one is what. And then I also had noticed a lot of patients bring back damaged cartridges that, you know, maybe fell on the ground or got crushed in a pocket. Um, you know, something happened in a purse or something. And when they brought it back, they usually tended to get uh, a replacement. So that was the focus that I got into. And I decided to come up with something that was a protective cover. Thank you. That helps a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Alicia, do you have any questions? Um, no, I had a similar question about the comp competitors, but I think she answered that. Time is up, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Thank you, judges. Thank you, Madison. Thank you, everyone. Stacey, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. We believe that completing your associate degree here at AACC is not the end. In fact, it is just the beginning. 
With the generous support from the Radcliffe Foundation, there are two incredible opportunities for transfer students who own a business or have entrepreneurial aspirations. The University of Baltimore's E-Fellows program, which is a fully paid academic opportunity through the Radcliffe Foundation is one of those. And the other is Salisbury University with their two AACC transfer scholarships. They're both funded by the Radcliffe Foundation and they pay for tuition, room, and board. We can answer questions about both of those opportunities at the virtual open house on Monday, May 11th. Our next business owner to pitch today is Cameron Davis with Socially Selective. Cameron, please prepare your pitch and signal when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. <clears throat> Have you ever saw a pair of unique sneakers and wondered where did that person get them from? Well, that's where I come in. My name is Cameron Davis and I'm the owner of Socially Selective. Socially Selective is a lifestyle company that connects fashionable people to quality clothes and sneakers. I resell hard to get sneakers to teens like me and my concierge clients who pay me to get the shoes that they want. Growing up, I have always loved fashion. A normal look for me is a nice shirt and a fresh pair of kicks. One day on social media, I noticed other people were buying and selling shoes, doing everything that I love to do. So I decided to do the same. I've made over $2,000 selling limited shoes like these Jordan Retro ones. I paid $200 for these shoes and people are willing to, are willing to pay up to $1,000 for this shoe. StockX is an online buying and selling platform for sneakers and fashion. There are other stores who buy and sell sneakers, but I only purchase and resell limited items. And I also provide a concierge service to my customers by knowing what they like and getting the shoes that they want and need based on their profile. In order to grow my company, I need to increase my market, purchase more inventory, and exhibit at local events. I also have a team of advisors who develop content and provide small investments. I am seeking an investment of $3,000 to grow my online market, buy inventory, and enroll in online fashion and sneaker classes to expand my knowledge. I'm Cameron Davis, and if you can't find it, I will. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. All right, it's time for Q&A with our judges. Candace, do you have any questions? Hi Cameron, you did a great job on your pitch and I have heard about this uh, problem through my students. They've been telling me about it. Um, I was just wondering about your current customers that you serve. Do you, um, do you have like a customer database or how many do you have following and working with you right now? So most of my followers, they come from StockX. So I sell anonymous to customers online but I also have a concierge service where I do have customers that are willing to ask me, hey, this is the shoe that I need, and I go and find the shoe for them. Okay. And I have a question. Sorry, I have a question from Joyce. Can I ask okay. that one? Um, do you anticipate more sneakers for sale now that the economy is not in good shape? And will people sell their sneakers to you to raise money for themselves? I think so, yes. People are getting rid of more sneakers, but also people are buying more sneakers. Uh, right now, there is a Michael Jordan documentary going on. It's called The Last Dance. So as people watch that documentary and learn more about his, leg his legacy, they are willing to buy his, you know, retro shoes just for like the memory. Okay. How about Vaughn? Any questions? No. Tim? How about Tina? I don't really have a question, but I think he did a great job and I thought his uh, business plan was pretty sound. Um, and that's basically all I have. Thank you. Alicia? Yeah, I, I agree. It was a good job, a good presentation. Um, do you have any thoughts about um, expanding? Because you talk a lot about the shoes and the, those types of things, but are you thinking about other other types of things you could get into? Eventually, yes. I want to also have my own clothing brand. So in the next year, I will be working on that. So yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Any other judge questions? 
All right. Well, thank you, Cameron. And thank you, judges. Back to Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, congrats, Cameron. All right. I would love to share some gratitude to our volunteers who help make, um, help prepare our students for this competition. And, you know, normally I would just say it, but I don't want to forget anybody. So I'm definitely going to look at my notes. So in addition to our sponsor, the Ratcliffe Foundation, there were many other people who were instrumental in helping our students prepare for the 2020 business pitch competition. Veronica Borland and Reb Beatty hosted web sh uh, workshops for this semester, preparing the resume, preparing financials. These are really important things and they helped prepare our students. And the students who submitted their plans online met with business plan coaches and advisors to review and improve their plans. In addition, our finalists had the opportunity to meet with a pitch coach and assist them in preparing for today. There were 24 business plan or business pitch coaches who supported our students and 10 of those coaches were from SCORE. Thank you to our coaches and especially thank you to SCORE for being such a valued partner. We really appreciate you. Please join me in thanking the folks who generously volunteered their time to share their guidance and advice, especially during this time where we had to uh, coach and um, work on pitch coaching virtually. The names of all of our uh, coaches are in the program that I posted to the chat. So hopefully you will take the time to review uh, the names of all of those who had supported us and um, understand that more than 40 hours of coaching the past few weeks went into preparing for this event. So judges, I hope you're ready um, for our next finalist. Our next business owner to pitch is Stephanie Steely with Traveler Massage. Stephanie, when you're ready, you let us know. I'll sit. I've tried a lot of things, from working in construction for my dad, to joining the Navy as a Chinese linguist, to professional wrestling here at MCW Maryland. And through all of those things, there was always a common factor, and it was people and pain. So now I'm trying to do something extraordinary for our community by asking for $22,000 to start my own business, Travel and Massage. Now, Massage is getting more and more recognized in the healthcare community for its help with relieving stress and pain, the way it improves sleep and mood, for how you can break up scar tissue of old injuries and to help rehabilitate new ones. But more often than not, self-care in our lives gets put on a back burner. Making self-care and rehabilitation tools like full body massage not only convenient, but accessible to those who can't make it to brick and mortar facilities on their own is the way to solve that problem. Now, currently in the Annapolis area, there are no mobile massage studios that travel to the client's home that don't have to go inside the client's home for a full body massage appointment. It's now Traveler Massage fills that gap. It is a mobile massage studio that's inside of a schoolie, which is really just a fun word for a remodeled school bus. And inside there's gonna be an office space, a half bath, and a room conducive to full body massage appointments. And with this investment, Traveler Massage will be able to be at the forefront of client care accessibility, and become a vital part of a client's healthcare team. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Stephanie. And now we have five minutes of Q&A with our um, judges. So we will start with Tina. Do you have a question for Stephanie? Yes, uh, I like their plan and her whole idea of going to the consumer but I had two questions. Could you give us some more information about your marketing plan? And also, where's your break even point if you're doing one massage at a time? Thanks. Yeah, no problem. So marketing, I'm going to utilize the time it takes to make this bus to market on social media because right now, like the tiny house movement is huge and remodeling old school buses is also huge. And there's tons of followings on people's social media accounts where they're basically documenting, documenting the way that they've redone their school buses or vans or their tiny houses. Um, and that's sort of like a way to get their business out because those are folks that are making the things. So this is a way to bring people in, kind of get invested in our story and our journey before we even start working in the first place. Um, and then once we are established, I'm going to have a graphic wrap on the bus. So that in-between timing that's kind of unbillable when I'm going from client to client is marketing in and of itself. Um, I'm trying to, I'm just want a clarification on what do you mean by break even? Do, like, what's my capacity? Yes. A bit. How many massages do you need to do a day, a week, or whatever to realize the profit and cover your expenses? 
Okay, yeah. So typically for a massage therapist, you can do about five to six a day before you start hurting your own body by doing them. Um, with like kind of the average price of being 120 just for an hour massage um, to go to the client's house. Um, it kind of covers a lot of the costs because it's about, I think for gas, it's something like nine, nine miles a gallon and a 60 gallon tank for a thing, for a, a bus. And I kept it inside the Annapolis area for that reason. Um, a capacity would be about five to six a day just because I don't want to hurt my own body and then make it so I can't massage at all. Um, but once we get bigger, the hope is to once again, make another mobile unit, employ a second therapist, and then have them also go out. And we had a question from Joyce. Um, she said an RV was mentioned in our plan, uh, financials, and how is that being used now? So it's, it, it, was up and a, it was up and about. You could use an RV or you could use a school bus. I chose a school bus because uh, my grandfather started the Bauman and Sons bus company up in New York City. Um, on Long Island, mostly, well, he's in Ron Concomo, but he travels all over. Um, so I was going to go to them specifically to look for a school bus because it's kind of, it's a family affair, I guess you could say. Um, if I wanted an RV, I could certainly go find one. The problem is a lot of used RVs are about the same price as it would be to give that money up to family in New York when I go and get a bus from them. And I can trust their mechanics, you know, are being forthright in how capable this bus is, how safe this bus is, and how much longer it's going to work. Okay. Um, Candace, do you have a question? Stephanie, can you elaborate your experience in the massage industry? Yeah. So I graduated from AACC's massage therapy program in 2018 December. Um, and then from there, I went to work at Elements Massage. Um, so I went to my an own, its own individual sort of retail facility. Um, I worked there for a couple months, and then I started to realize that maybe I wanted to try to do something a little bit different. Um, I was running into immunosuppressed patients or clients, sorry, and things like that. And I was thinking to myself, you know, how do I help them? Um, I also, with pro wrestling, with MCW and Joppa, I work with the athletes. Um, so I focus mostly on rehabilitating or helping to rehabilitate injuries that they've gotten that their healthcare team is dealing with. And then typically they'll just come to me with, you know, oh, my shoulder, all this hurts. And they'll say, hey, can you help? And of course I can help, um, which is kind of the whole thing that I want to do is I'm here to help people. Alicia, do you have a question? Yes, I actually have two questions. Um, I commend you on your passion. You seem really excited about this and it comes through. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, how can you talk a little bit about your rationale to get to your price point? Because obviously you are bringing the service to people. So there's a convenience there. And my second question is about the ambiance. One of the things I really like about getting massage is that I can kind of tune out the world. So how have you thought about um, creating that environment within a school bus that's going to possibly be parked on the street where there might be traffic or what have you if you go to someone's home? Um, I just wanted to clarify again on the pricing. Do you mean, like, how did I come to prices for the massage, or? Yes. Okay. In, yeah. Uh, I, I took basically what the average cost of a massage is just to go to a studio, um, and then I kind of took into account how much gas would cost. Um, so, because with me moving, it's costing me to go to these clients. Mm -hmm. So then the way I figured it out was I kind of did the math of, you know, the nine gallons, nine gallon, nine miles a gallon, 60 gallon tank, um, and sort of figure out a way that I could, so I bumped it up for my hour massage is 120, and I think typically- Okay, that's time. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you couldn't get all of your questions answered, Dr. Marshall. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, I am going to hand it back over to Stacy. And again, just a reminder, make sure your mic is muted if you aren't speaking. Thank you. I'd like to share some additional gratitude today before we hear from our very last finalist. First and foremost, I want to shout out a personal thank you to the amazing Stephanie Goldenberg for her countless hours of organizing, preparing, and coaching to ensure that today's event went as smoothly as possible. I also want to thank Alicia Renahan and John Wood for figuring out the logistics for recording and live streaming this event. And thank you to our very talented strategic communications team for the design and marketing production efforts. Thank you again to John Wood and DSS for arranging Cheryl Little to provide closed captions. 
And thank you to our ESI faculty and mentor team. We had Tony Baker, Steve Berry, Brenda Diltz, Tanisha Duru, Latanya Eggleston, Stephanie Goldenberg, Kevin Logan, Ken Jarvis, Lindsay McCullough, Candace Pruitt, and Mikhail Ewan. I also want to thank Heather Harrington, Emily O'Donnell, and Donna Sutherland for all their support in managing all of these details. And thank you to the eClub president, Daniel Levy, for facilitating networking and testing our Zoom platform. And now for our very last finalist, Sarah Gray Foreman with Violetta's LLC. Sarah, please prepare to pitch and let us know when you're ready. All right, um, mic check, can you guys hear me? Yes. Wonderful. All right. Hello, everyone. I am Sarah Gray Foreman, and I am the owner of Violetta's, a home-based small business based out of Covington, Louisiana. We specialize in floral design in the wedding industry. Here at Violetta's, we strive to create something truly unique. Each bouquet has every detail meticulously chosen. We search all avenues from wholesalers to flower farmers and even forage to find our clients the most perfect blooms. Our event-based focus allows for one-on-one -on -one customer service. We have been featured in the Wedding Guide of New Orleans, the Isle Society, and Rue Design Bridal. We have even been commissioned by Anthropology and Company for retail bouquet sales at various locations in Baltimore and DC. The wedding industry is a blooming one, with an estimated $55 billion spent annually on weddings in the United States. Within a two hour driving distance from our private studio, our target market hosts close to 15,000 weddings. The average cost of a wedding in Louisiana is 29,000 and floristry accounts for about eight to 10% of the wedding budget. So one wedding typically draws revenues upwards of 2,800 for Violetta's. Our marketing plan includes person-to-person -person marketing, online advertisement, social media presence, and collaborations with other businesses in the area. In our fifth year, in our first year of operations, Violetta's plans to execute 24 weddings and to break even by our ninth client. I am here today to ask you for an $8,000 investment to launch Violetta's on a strong foundation. The investment will be largely used for equipment to keep our product in pristine condition. Secondly, the investment will be used to sustain six months of marketing. Thank you for your time, and I hope you can make our dreams at Violetta's come true so that we can do the same for others on the most memorable day of their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Now the judges and Sarah have time for Q&A. <clears throat> Alicia, you want to go first? Oh, yeah. Um, hi, this was a great uh, presentation. I just wanted to ask if you've taken into consideration COVID and how that might impact your um, the wedding Definitely, um, definitely. So my mentor told me that these restrictions holding us back could push us forward. So taking that into consideration, um, you know, with COVID, people are still going to get married. You know, we may uh, focus on smaller weddings, um, smaller gathering weddings, but also um, Violetta's by our year three, we are looking to open a brick and mortar retail location, selling plants and flowers, antiques, and offering like do-it-yourself classes. So this would be a good way to kind of enter into that field if COVID, you know, has us uh, restricted on weddings. So I could offer wreaths, do-it-yourself, um, you know, plant consultations. I could offer. Um, terrariums, uh, flower subscriptions, you know, so there's a lot of ways to kind of branch into still getting that person to person, um, you know, marketing and really trying to brand Violetta's, you know, so instead of focusing on weddings, if, you know, COVID continues, you know, we um, will focus elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Anything from Tina? Yeah, uh, great presentation. Um, just a question. Do you have any contingency plans? For example, if a wedding gets canceled, um, unhappy customers, because I know you have qu quite an investment in flowers. 
Definitely, um, definitely. So with basic contingency plans, for instance, with the COVID, I've had a few brides have to reschedule their weddings. Luckily, I had the date open. So it was just kind of a quick switch. Um, so that didn't really harm us too much. However, if a bride decides, you know, ultimately she didn't like the flowers or um, the color was off or, you know, here at Violetta's, you know, we really try to make the customer happy. So whatever that is, if we need to refund, if we need to, um, you know, create a, an anniversary arrangement to keep on good terms, we're going to do whatever we can to make that customer happy. Now, um, say someone decided to cancel altogether, I do require a deposit to book your date. So once that deposit is handled, I do have on my contract that you will not get your deposit back if you decide to cancel. I mean, of course, there are some circumstances where, you know, it's up to my discretion whether I will refund the deposit or not. So there's some ways that I've been working with the contingency plans. You know, I have some in place. Thank you. How about Candace? Hi, great job on your presentation. Thanks, and Candace. <laughs> and I had a quick question just yep. to clarify. Um, are you currently living in Louisiana? I am. Um, I was in Maryland for three years with my husband, and um, that's really where I got a lot of this experience in my background, um, you know, working with the florists in Baltimore and D.C., and um, we moved back two months ago. Yeah. So, yeah, Violetta's, uh, it really was to get my experience and education was in Maryland, and eventually it was to open up this business in Louisiana. And you've opened up two months ago? Uh, March, it was like March 15th when I actually got my LLC and did all that stuff. And Louisiana is the only state that requires you to have a floral license. So you had to prepare for that, take the test. Um, so yeah, it, it's been a month. Thank you. I, reading your business plan, it sounded like you were already open. So I just wanted to clarify. Yep. Oh, and also, um, I do have experience as owning my own sole proprietorship at, um, Sarah, uh, it's Gray Foreman Designs, and I've had over 10 weddings myself where I have um, done the proposals, did the consult, set up the wedding, everything by myself. Um, so I do have that experience with, you know, already dealing with clients. And so last year we did about 10 weddings. Great. How about Vaughn? Yes. Um... On your projections, you have the same revenue every month. Now, I haven't been in a wedding or had one for a long time. I, I don't think of January and de December as big wedding times. Do you have the ability to make these revenues if you get more peak periods so it's yes. not all flat? Yes, sir. So um, basically, like definitely like uh, later fall, uh, later summer, early fall is the prime time for, um, you know, weddings. Uh, but on the other months, you know, even with projections posting, you know, having four weddings in one month, so once a week, um, that's kind of what we just projected as like the projection. Now we could go in and manually fix that to where the month of September and October, we're going to have seven weddings versus you know, one wedding, you know, in the other month versus, you know, having four all the way around. Um, but in those times, especially with like January, December, February, kind of those um, later winter months, um, people have been getting married. Um, they're starting to save more on the budget. So it hasn't been a a shock to see that it's less, but people are still getting married. Um, and the past three years, I've been working as a floral designer, and um, a lot of the florists I work for still had three weddings in January, still had three weddings in February, um, December one or two, but still, um, to make it easier on myself, it was easy just to do the same projections for every month versus individually going in and cycling things out. I think time is up, so I'm going to have to say thank you to Sarah. And thank, thank you. you to yes. Oh, wow, that was, that was amazing. All of you should be so proud of yourselves um, from our first 
uh, coaching time to now, it's just amazing. And just the pressure of doing this on Zoom and not in person, um, you just did an amazing job. And we're just really so proud of all our finalists. Stacy. And now that you've seen all our finalists pitch, you, our audience members, have the power to choose the fan favorite for today. You should see a poll appear on your screen where you can choose one finalist you would like to receive that $500 reward for being the fan favorite. And we will announce the winner after we return from our break. So we're gonna give you a couple minutes to choose your favorite pitch, and then I will end the polling. All right, time is up. We have 93 votes in. We will announce the results later. Thank you very much. And so what I'm doing now, what's going to happen next is we're going to ask the judges to move to the Zoom breakout room. Don't worry, you don't have to go find it. I'm going to put you in a Zoom breakout room so that you can do your judging. Um, and so what's going to happen is Stacy and I are going to join our judges into a breakout room for about 30 minutes um, as we deliberate and determine the, um, as the judges determine the awards that we will present after break. Ooh. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you weren't too anxiously awaiting for our announcements. But just to stall a little bit longer, we're going to announce our new co cohort of $12,000 Radcliffe Scholars. And to do that, I am going to turn this over to Steve Berry to share all about that with you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stacy, Stephanie. First of all, I do want to thank Stephanie for all her hard work with this. You have been awesome. Uh, you're incredible. You just, you, you rock. That's the, all we can say. And I think if, if we were in the big room, we'd have a big round of applause for you. So thank you for that. I um, also want to uh, congratulate all the presenters and all the applicants to the Radcliffe Scholarship Program. Uh, you did great. You're putting yourself out there and that's a wonderful thing. You've learned, you've grown from this and that's great. Uh, thank you to the judges who looked at the applications for the Entrepreneur Scholarship. Mikhail Yuan, Brenda McElrath Diltz, Kevin Logan, and Lori Gardner. Uh, if you're in the room, thank you. Um, the scholarship is competitive. Not everybody gets it, uh, and it's becoming more and more competitive every year. We're expecting uh, more from our students. And you know what? The students have responded and have done great. Uh, so, but not everybody earns it. Not everybody gets it. Uh, so what I want to say to you is I'm about to read the names of those in about 20 seconds of about those who do, who are recipients of the scholarship. If you applied and you do not hear your name, don't give up. Okay, you can apply again, contact me, and I'm happy to meet with you and talk to you about uh, your application, what the judges said, and to help you improve it. We're all about learning and improvement and success. We want you to grow and be successful. Um, also, we have a summer rolling application. Um, on the first of every month, all the applications that are 100% complete, that means two letters of recommendation, your FAFSA's in, we've got everything that we need from you, um, and your GP, we look at your GPA, those will be passed off to the judges, and then we'll have a rolling uh, acceptance throughout the summer, uh, and that will end on August 1st. So don't give up. Uh, you're a business owner. Business owners get told no a lot. The ones who succeed are the ones that don't give up. So, drum roll, everybody. Okay, all right. Uh, and if I read your name, if I read your name, you should have May 15th on your calendar for orientation. We're gonna do a virtual orientation to the program. But these are the following are the people who uh, are accepted into the Ratcliffe Entrepreneur Scholarship Program. Um, and thank you to the Ratcliffe Foundation for funding this. Well, Amanda Gwynn, Amanda Vu, Anna Jacobson, Antonio, Antonia Saran Rosso, Dylan, and I know I'm going to mess this up and I apologize, Dylan Seibenauer, I hope I got that right, Edgardo Keurig, Liz Cawley, Madison Bird, Natalia Amaya, Orky Bradley, Stephanie Steely, St 
Stephen Taman, Virgil Collington, William Reynolds, Yasan Hassan. If I called your name, congratulations. You will get an email. Jay Orky. Yay. Congratulations. Congratulations, Orky. Okay. You will get an nice email job. from me with a PDF version of an acceptance letter. Read that. We'll get you to sign it. We'll go over it during orientation and you'll learn a lot more about the program, what's expected of you and what you get from it. Uh, with that, um, I'm going to sign off, say congratulations to everybody. And now for the main award, Stephanie, take it over. I'm actually going to hand this to Stacy, and just to say Orky was waiting patiently in the uh, waiting room and didn't hear the announcement. So hopefully, you know, with all the congratulations. <laughs> I heard the very end of it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I got kicked out for some reason. I'm sorry. Well, I, I tried to let you in. I was trying to be very, very careful so that we didn't overrun any other announcement. But anyway. Thank you. All right, Stacy, I'm going to hand this over to you. Make sure your, um, your mics are muted, please. Thank you, Steve, and congratulations to our new scholars. And now for the awards. You all voted, and you chose the business pitch that will receive the $500 Fan Favorite Award. And our winner is Jenna with Love Lola. Congratulations. Oh my God, thanks so much. I'm sure it was all Lola that's really sealed. <laughs> you. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it back to Stephanie. Okay, so you know this was a really difficult decision. And I really had to say, okay, we have 15 minutes in, it's time to make this decision. Um, the judges really did work hard to determine the awards for today. And what we're going to do is we're going to announce each business and the amount they receive. And please note that each business requested different amounts. So there's not really a first, second, or third place, but there are higher dollar awards in this particular uh, competition. So what we will do is announce more of the um, we're going to go in reverse order so that it'll be the highest amount will be announced last. Okay. All right. So our first awardee is going to have $1,000. Congratulations to Powered Pop Protection. $1,000. Yay. Our second award is for $2,000. And that is in the... Um, and that is for our Traveler Massage. Congratulations to Traveler Massage for $2,000. Our third award is for $4,000, and that goes to Bookkeepers by the Bay. And our fourth award is also for $4,000 to Violetta's LLC. Congratulations to both of you all. And then we have two $5,000 awards. We have $5,000 going to Socially Selective and $5,000 going to Baked and Brunched. Congratulations to the two of you. And then for number seven, we have $6,000 and that is going to Casa Pena Designs. Congratulations to Heidi. And then for our final two, we have $8,000 going to Clover Run Riding. Congratulations. And our last award today is for $15,000. And that's going to our fan favorite, Love Lola. Congratulations, everybody. Okay, we are so proud of all our scholars and our business competition finalists. And now to just share a few words, I wanna make sure Carleen Cassidy is in the house. Um, to join me in thanking and welcoming um, our new scholars and our finalists. And just to say a few words, Carleen Cassidy, director of the Ratcliffe Foundation, if you're here, please uh, share your words with our group. Sure. Well, awesome, awesome event. Under these circumstances, I couldn't even imagine it turning out this phenomenal. Uh, Sarah, you touched it on the head when you said it's so hard to do public speaking. 
And in my opinion, it's actually harder to do it in this environment. I want to congratulate all of the finalists on doing a fantastic job getting outside your comfort zone. I didn't have an opportunity to read your business plans, but I heard from the judges that they were outstanding. Your pitches were great. Your business ideas are awesome. As Dean Cook said early on in the program, small businesses are the heart of our economy. Right now, the economy is struggling, but it, it's all of you. And that's all the alumni. I saw the list everybody that's participating. All the alumni that are on here. It's so awesome to see you supporting this year cohort. You all represent the future and create jobs and bring this to come back and have new and innovative ideas. But I just couldn't be more excited to see all those great ideas. I'm looking forward to following your progress. To new Redcliffe scholars, welcome to an extraordinary program that will change your life. You've heard from some of the current scholarship recipients. You've seen Professor Goldberg, Professor Barry, Professor Ewart, uh, maybe not on the screen, but on this call, the Radcliffe mentors. I saw Ken Jarvis and the Tanya Eggleston and Mikhail Yuan and uh, Tony Baker and all of them. They're there to help you succeed. It is all about trying to set you up for success and achieving your goals and dreams. The Radcliffe Foundation, we have one little teeny tiny piece in that. And that is having the good fortune of providing some financial support. I can tell you that Phil and Carol Rackla would be so proud to see the achievement and accomplishment of all of you. It's all about the students and student success. You all hit it out of the park. Congratulations. Continue to go forward and do great things. Thank you so much, Carleen. Good to see you virtually. Thank you for our sponsorship. The Radcliffe Foundation has been an amazing supporter of our student entrepreneurs, and we are very grateful. Thank you also to our judges. You all work so hard. And thank you to everyone who submitted to the competition. We wouldn't be here without you. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. And thanks for joining us virtually this year.